Welcome to the On My Workbench channel. Back in 1981, the U.S. Air Force sent me to King Salmon Air Force Station in Alaska. King Salmon is a remote station located at the top of the Aleutian chain. We like to say that King Salmon was not the end of the earth, but you could see it from there. King Salmon became operational in November of 1951 as King Salmon Air Force Station. This is where I worked. It was called the Ground to Air Transmitter and Receiver Site, or Gator Site. It housed VHF and UHF transmitters and receivers that were used to communicate with military and civilian aircraft. At the Gator Site, we worked a single eight-hour shift from 0800 to 1700 hours, with an hour for lunch. That's 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. to use civilians. We rotated emergency calls at night and on weekends and holidays. So when you were not working, you had a lot of free time on your hands. When I was not working, I kept myself busy flying model airplanes and exploring the old decommissioned tropo scatter site nearby on my Honda Odyssey four-wheeler that I bought from a guy on base. He did not know how to work on or repair it, so when it broke, he sold it to me. It kept me busy repairing it and driving it. There were times when if we could not get our crew truck started due to cold weather, I would drive the Odyssey to work at the Gator site. We had a lot of free time on our hands. Everyone there was on a one-year deployment. A year may be a year, but it feels much longer when you have little to do and a lot of time. I was told that years before, some of the guys working at the Gator site had built a low-power FM radio station that transmitted on 105 megahertz. I thought that was cool. So I started playing around with one of the backup VHF transmitters. These were GRT-21 radio transmitters manufactured by ITT Aerospace Optical Division. The GRT-21 transmitters are synthesized amplitude modulated very high frequency transmitters with a frequency range of 116 to 150 megahertz. I wanted to see if I could get one to transmit on 105 megahertz. Even though it would be AM, I wanted to see if it would. I used the same procedure that we used to tune the GRT-21 for ATC air traffic control frequencies and it worked on 105 megahertz like it was made for it. I used the front panel meter on the transmitter to display the RF output power and to check the SWR. I could not believe both were still well within the usable range on 105 megahertz. Next I disconnected the frequency synthesizer from the input to the RF filter and replaced it with our HP 8640B signal generator. I set the output of the signal generator for 105 megahertz with no modulation, the RF output to off, the output power range setting as low as I could set it, then I turned on the RF output switch. I set the front panel meter on the GRT-21 to display forward RF power and watched the meter as I started increasing the output of the signal generator. I continued increasing the output of the signal generator until the meter on the front panel displayed 10 watts. I stopped at 10 watts and that's the rated output power for the GRT-21. I did not want to overdrive and damage the RF amplifier. I know it will output as much as 50 watts on 105 megs, but I won't say how I know. Next I set the output of the signal generator to frequency modulation and to the internal 1 kHz tone with 75 kHz of deviation. We had an AM FM radio that we used on AM to listen to Armed Forces Radio Network. We switched it over FM, tuned it to 105 MHz and could hear the 1 kHz tone coming over the air. I had done it. I took a VHF AM transmitter and got it to output an FM signal on 105 megahertz at 10 watts and still stay within the safe forward and reflected power range of the transmitter. The HP 8640B signal generator has an external input that can be used with an audio source to modulate the RF output of the signal generator. I set the signal generator to use its external input and connected the output from a cassette player to the external input of the signal generator and played a tape. We could hear the music from the tape over the air on the FM radio. One of the guys called the detachment headquarters about a mile away and asked them if they had a radio in the office and was told yes. He asked them to put it on FM and tune it to 105 megahertz. They did and could hear the music coming from my Kaluge Together radio transmitter. That was the start of WYNO FM 105 at King Salmon Air Force Station in Alaska. It did not take long before the NCO in charge of the Gator site decided we needed to find WYNO a new home. So it was moved into my room in the barracks 
and set up on a table with a single phonograph and a single cassette player. We've got the guy in charge of the base telephone system to connect up a couple of direct phone lines from the, my room to the Gator site. One of the phone pairs was used to send the audio out to the Gator site to the input of the transmitter. The second pair was used to remotely key the transmitter. So when WYNO was not on the air, the transmitter wasn't transmitting just dead air. This only lasted a few days, as my roommate did not like the stream of guys coming in to see how the radio station worked. So again, we had to find WYNO a new home. We were given the use of an 8 foot by 15 foot storage room on the second floor of the barracks. As it turned out, this worked out very well. It allowed us to run WYNO all hours of the day and night without disturbing anyone. The base carpentry shop built us an 8 foot wide, 2 foot deep console to mount turntables, cassette decks, a boom microphone, and the new push button control panel that I had built. I built the push button control panel from bits and pieces that I scrounged from all over the base. I used a blank 19 inch rack panel for the basis of the control panel. The two rows of push buttons were from an old multi line telephone, as was a rotary dial. I did not have a hole saw to make the holes in the panel, so I drew a circle where I wanted a larger hole, and I used a punch to mark where to drill smaller holes so I could cut them out to make it a bigger hole. I used a small drill bit to drill the holes around the circle, then I used a small pointed flat file to fill out the aluminum in between the holes. I did this for the phone dial and for the speaker located in the upper left corner of the panel. After I removed the centers, I used a large curved cutting file to clean up the inner radius of the holes. To do the square holes for the push buttons, I measured the center spacing of the buttons and drilled five round holes, first with a small bit, working my way up to a quarter inch bit. Then I used a small square file, a triangle file, and a flat file to file out the holes until they were nice and square. I did this for the top five holes and repeated it for the bottom five holes. It took forever to do. It was somewhat crude, but it worked for us. The way it worked was the top row of buttons was for selecting the audio that went to the transmitter, and the bottom row was for cueing the next song. I used the top row of buttons for the over-the-air audio, so when you were cueing a record or a tape, you did not accidentally hit one of the over-the-air buttons, switching to a turntable or a tape deck that was not playing, causing dead air. The switch on the right was used to switch from the over-the-air music to the over-the-air microphone. The cueing and over-air buttons were labeled T1 for Tape 1, T2 for Tape 2, P1 for Phonograph 1, and P2 for Phonograph 2. The knob to the left of the two headphone jacks was used to set the audio level for the headphones. The wiring for the console and control panel was inside the console. The bottom of the console was hinged on the back and would drop down for access to the wiring. I look at it today and wonder what was I thinking when I built and wired it. The way it worked was you would select the music that you wanted to play before you went on the air and set it on the shelf to the left of the console in the order it was to be played. Then you'd put on the headphones. If your first song was a phonograph record, you'd put the record on one of the turntables and press the cueing button for that turntable and set the needle on the record to the track to be played. You would start the phonograph to confirm it was on the correct track, stop the phonograph, reset the needle back to the beginning of the track. As soon as the song that was playing over the air stopped, you would start the phonograph player, wait a second or two, and then press the corresponding button on the top row of the transmit buttons. The one to two second delay would allow the turntable to get up to speed before the audio went out over the air. We used the same procedure for tapes, but without the delay. It was harder to cue a tape. One of the guys would pre-record his own tapes with only one song per tape. He would add a cueing tone just before the song started, so all he had to do was put the tape in the deck, fully rewind it, wait for the cueing tone to stop, hit the stop button on the tape deck, and he was ready to go. He would come in with a box full of tapes, all cued and ready to play. He was good. In later revisions of the control panel, I incorporated a way to answer the telephone and hear the telephone audio in the headphones and use the boom mic to talk over the phone. We could even patch phone calls over the air. As Wino got to be more and more popular, more people wanted to do it. We had more people than we had time slots. To prevent time conflicts and arguments, I set up a scheduling board on a first-come, first-served basis. I mounted it on the wall of the studio next to one end of the console. The scheduling board was set up as a grid with the days of the week across the top and the hours of the day in two-hour blocks down the left side. It was a two-foot by four-foot piece of plywood painted white with a two-foot by four-foot sheet of plexiglass over top of it. 
The grid had the days of the week and the hours of the day printed directly on it. The plexiglass so anyone wanted to work the station could use a grease pencil to write their name in for the times that they wanted to work. We would hold contests like scavenger hunts where the first prize was two free games of bowling at King Salmon's two-lane bowling alley or a free pizza. On the scavenger hunt, participants would sign up as teams. If we had three teams or more, we'd start giving out the items to look for over the air. The teams could look on or off base for the items. One of the items to find was a soda bottle cap, the ones that you had to have an opener to remove. Another was a record of a song that we were looking for. I think it was Chuck Berry's My Little ding -a -ling. We actually got two copies on 45. The hardest thing to find, and we thought no team would ever find it, was a roller skate key. It was the last thing found, but one of the teams found one in a place where there was no place to roller skate. While I was at King Salmon, we had a combined officers NCO club. One night, the club manager called the station and told us they had a shortage of drinking glasses because people were taking the glasses back to their rooms. He asked us to make an announcement over the air that anyone that would bring five glasses back to the club would get a free drink. After about an hour, he called back and told us to stop because they had so many glasses and no place to put them. After the station had been run in a few months, a couple of butter bar lieutenants thought the station should not be run by an airman three-striper and went to the commander to see if they could take it over. The commander told them outright no. He told them that I had started it and I would run it for as long as I wanted to or until I went to my next assignment. He was one of the good guys. That brings me to a time when we had to shut the station down because of a guy that was ticked off at our detachment commander. As he was going to his next assignment, he threatened to call the FCC and report WYNO. The commander asked us to temporarily shut down the station until he could get it straightened out. The station was down for about a week. I never really heard what had transpired, but was told through a reliable source that our detachment commander went to the base commander to talk it over. The base commander pushed it up the chain of command and talked to some big brass somewhere. The base commander told the brass that WYNO radio was a big morale booster for the base. He told them how we used the station to get in touch with people that may not be on the base, but was needed in the event of an emergency or an outage. It was like having a base and town-wide public address system. He told them if someone was on call, they could go out and still be contacted in the event they were needed, as long as they could hear the radio station. He told the brass that it also helped build good relations with the people in the town of King Salmon. The brass told the base commander to tell our commander to put it back on the air. So our commander called me while I was at work and told me to put it back on the air ASAP. There was not very much to running WINO. It mostly ran itself. To start with, we only had three rules. One, keep it professional over the air. Two, keep it clean over the air. And three, be nice over the air. Later, we had to add a fourth, fifth, and a sixth rule. No drinking in the studio. No work in the station if you had been drinking. And no one that had been drinking allowed in the studio. These last three rules were brought on by someone that had been drinking that went on the air and broke the first three rules. I received several calls from listeners that had recorded him on tape. We had him removed and replaced. He was suspended for a month and told if he ever did it again, he would be permanently suspended. We had come so very close to losing the station once before, and we did not need some clown screwing it up for everyone. Even though we were operating with a wink and a nod, we were still representing the U.S. Air Force. One of the things that we did at WYNO was to take call-in requests to play songs. There were two young girls in town. One's name was Heidi. I can't remember the other one's name. They would call us up and request the same song over and over again. The song was We Got the Beat by the Go-Go's. We got so sick of playing that song that we had a contest and the winner got to break the record over the year. I was very surprised when Major General Robert F. McCarthy, the commander of the Air Force Communications Command, during an Air Force Communications Command visit, commended WYNO and me for our contributions to the site and to the local community by providing the radio station. The last I heard, WYNO was shut down and went off the air about a year after I left. I was told that the new NCO in charge of the Gator site was a bit of a stuffed shirt and for some reason did not like the station. So he had the guys at the Gator site shut it down and dismantle it. I would like to thank everyone that volunteered their time to work at WYNO. I think we can all proudly share in the recognition that we received from General McCarthy and the Air Force Communications Command. It would not have been possible without the help of everyone that contributed their time and efforts to WINO FM 105, The Sound of King Salmon. I thank you all. Please check back with the On My Workbench channel for more videos on cool stuff. Please subscribe, like, comment, and click the little bell. And thanks from the On My Workbench channel.